Exclamation, everybody, and welcome back to Sorcery. We're taking up, we're picking up where we left off in uh, this little village here. Let us move on and continue our journey. You wake early and sit for a moment, in no great hurry to leave the village. This is now the third day of your journey, and the muscles in your legs are feeling lean and strong from so much walking. You spend a short while enjoying the peace, then unhurriedly collect your possessions and set off along the path. Christantani is surrounded by several miles of fields, a filthy town set into a bowl of mud. As you follow the path between lines of sun-baked crops, you come to a fork in the road. A right-hand way leads past a set of outbuildings, while the left heads directly off into a deep woodland. All right, well, let us... Uh, I think I've had enough of the woods for now. Let's go between the buildings. You glimpse a few people at work by the buildings. There will be precious little company on your journey, so you should take it while you can. Approaching a low wall, you see a blind beggar, sheltering in the shade with his hand held outstretched. He hears your approach and clicks his fingers. Alms, would you? For the love of Sindler, alms. Uh, throw him a coin. You place a coin in his outstretched hand. You are kind, traveler, the beggar says. He feels over the surface of the coin and then bites down on it. Why, me? This is a gold piece. You're too generous to a poor sightless beggar. You'll get me killed if anyone knows that I have it. The beggar beams up at you. Um, look after yourself. Look after yourself, you say, preparing to walk away. Wait, he calls. One moment, please. He begins to scrabble around, feeling over his body, as if looking for holes. Eventually he cries, Aha! and pulls out a copper key, which he holds out to you. Uh, take it. You take the key and pocket it. Thank you. Years ago, <laughs> years ago, I lived in Carre, he explains. Carre was my home, and in the city ports, I watched over prisoners in the gale. Jail, actually. That's how you say jail. <laughs> Memory. Get it right. Beware. Beware the red eyes in Kare, for my or my fate will befall you, and you'll be here with me, begging for your living. What are the red eyes? Pray you'll never find out, is his simple reply. Listen to me. Kare is wary of strangers, but this key will help you if you are be captured by red eyes. Trust old me. As the man talks, you step quickly out of the road. As an ox cart whips past you, ra raising dust, it does not stop. Thank him and move on. Thank you, you say, then move on. You follow the path away from the village for half the morning. The walk is easy. It feels as natural as breathing to have the road beneath your f move beneath your feet. Hard to believe you trained for this journey so long, now that you are on it. You climb a little, tracing the side of the group of trees until you meet a fork in the road. You could continue straight on and upwards, or turn west a while. Um, turn for the trees or straight on. Eh, let's go straight on. Why not? I feel like that would be appropriate. You continue along the path, climbing. Your legs feel strong and lean. By the end of this journey, you will be built like a mountain goat. The afternoon progresses, long and easy. This place you are walking through seems thick with desolation, as if it was long ago abandoned. And then, as if to confirm your thought, you come across two enormous stone pillars, listing slightly either side of the road. They form a gate, but the gate is three times the height of a man. I look them over. Peering closely, you make out the faded remains of carved characters in the old script, L and K, the, rem the remnant of, the sp of a spell of fortune, perhaps, or of binding for those now fallen stones. Hmm. Uh, go through. There is nothing for it but to go forwards. All right, let's go through the gate. You step into the shadow of the enormous gate. The ruins of the walls line the path either side, but these walls are built from blocks the size of ox carts. Centuries ago, this must have been a palace of a king 12 feet tall. 
Now it has been leveled, and the stones stolen for the field walls and foundations of all the village of the villages all around. Uh, continue climbing or investigate the ruins. Let's investigate the ruins. You take a moment to clamber out over the ruins and off the path until you are surrounded by waist-high grasses. The ground rises and falls sharply around the outlines of houses and buildings. You trace the line of a street wide enough to run three carts abreast that leads quickly downhill towards a forest. Once this place was rich and plentiful, what happened here to remove every last trace? What happened here to remove every last trace of these colossal people? Hmm. Look inside a house. You stop by the edge of a house. The side wall only stands as high as your knees. Grass nods above it. Looking inside, you can make out the edges of a fireplace, the back wall, and an adjoining area. Perhaps a grain store or a bedroom. Hmm. Uh, search in the grass. You take a few moments to search through the long grasses and find nothing, until your hand closes on a clay pot near one wall. It is the shape of a wine jug, but about three times the usual size. Around the neck is a red stain. Wine? Or maybe blood? It is impossible to tell. The base of the pot has been smashed away, perhaps by age, perhaps by someone unhappy with the contents. You leave the pot behind. Uh, follow the street down. You follow the line of the street down the slope of the hill. The further you go from the path, the more overgrown the ruins become, until you can barely make out their outlines at all. After a while, you are not following the street at all, but simply holding to the same line. You approach the edge of a thick woodland. Alright. Um, turn back and climb. Where's... Enter the tree line. Um, turn back and climb, I guess. Is the way we want to go. The path crosses over a low, broken wall and then rises sharply uphill through a pass. After a while, you see two cave mouths, one to the left of the path and another to the right. Hmm. Do I go into the left-hand cave, the right-hand cave, or carry on? I don't know why I would go cave-dwelling. Uh, but I guess perhaps there is the possibility that I could find some loot. So let us go to the left-hand cave. The left-hand cave is a little wider in its mouth, but it is also not deep and appears to be empty. Rubble covers the floor along with a few items that suggest someone lived here. A huge broken stool, a net with a wide mesh, and a large human-shaped skull the size of a dog. This place was clearly home to a giant. Uh, investigate what's here. Still, by the look of the skull, it seems that giant is long gone, so it should be safe to look around. Uh, look at the net. You pick up the net. The squares are so large that a rabbit or deer would be able to run straight through, but they're small enough that they could catch an animal of about your size. Of course, you'd cut away, you cut your way out of such a trap in a moment. Um, take the net. Uh, look at the stool. Next, you turn your attention to the stool. It is made from the lower branches of an ash tree, braced together with joint pins the size of your forearm. And before the stool broke, it could probably have borne the weight of several cattle. But it's broken now and of no use to you, and there's no way you could carry it far. Um, look at the skull. Finally, you look at the giant's skull. There's no trace of flesh remaining on the bone, and the eye sockets are dull and empty. No one has lived in here for a long time. The top of the skull has been knocked about a bit. There's a crack in the top, and most of the teeth are missing. Uh, examine the teeth. Oh, I hit the wrong one. Uh, yeah, I don't even know what I hit there. I've seen enough. You turn to leave the cave. Okay, uh, let's look at the right-hand cave. Crossing the path, you go over to the other cave. There's a faint whistling sound. The wind, perhaps? Uh, go further in. You creep further in, then a few steps on, you stumble and fall. And as you do so, the whistling stops. To your horror, you realize that what you have tripped over is a foot. A giant slowly rubs its eyes and gets to its feet. It hoists up a massive stone club. Well, uh, probably should have saw that coming. 
<laughs> Let us fight. It's got 11 stamina. All right, so let's defend for a moment. Now, that was nothing. I should have just attacked. With a roar that shakes the rock, the giant swings its club and comes for you. Determined to crack open your bones, you raise your sword to cover your body as he tries to push you back with his great hand. You are mostly unhurt. He raises his club across his body defensively. All right, let's just do a, a jab since he's defending. go. Stealing your courage, you move on, aiming to trap the giant against the cave wall, teasing the giant with a passing blow, wearing him down. He flicks your attack neatly away with his club. He is left breathless, but otherwise unharmed. His stupid eyes are watching you closely, not wanting to... to... take a risk. <laughs> Everything's hiding behind this guy here. Um, Alright, let's do a little bit more than that, maybe? Yeah, okay, that, that works. You strike again, grabbing a handful of dust. You throw it in the monster's eyes. The giant deflects as well as he can. He staggers against the cave wall, and the ground shakes. His eyes follow your movements cautiously. All right, let's do a little bit more than that this time. Let's do a cut. Excellent. You strike again. Uh, I'm sorry. You lunge forwards again. Writing a blow that could part stone, you hurtle forwards. The giant parries slowly. He tumbles to his knees, almost crushing you as he as he goes down. <laughs> the giant is so large, I'm having trouble reading the text behind him. Uh, so, let's see. Uh, let's do that again, I guess. Do a, a cut. Ooh, that was bad. Yeah, I should have figured that was going to happen. You attempt an attack and suffer for it. The giant raises its enormous club and brings it crushing down on you. You're caught off balance. You stagger to the rock floor, stunned by the, by the blow. Well, we're going to have to defend this time. You drop down, protecting yourself as the giant swipes its uh, terrible club. You throw yourself to the ground. You are largely unscathed. All right, let's do something a little bit more powerful here. Nice. Taking a chance, you move forwards. Moving swiftly, you aim for his heart. The giant ducks clumsily. The hill giant stumbles suddenly. He is weakening. All right. Um, defend. Go. Expecting a storm, you raise your guard as the giant swipes its terrible swings its terrible club. You duck and roll. You are mostly unhurt. Oh, I didn't want to defend again. Well, I guess I could. I guess that was a good thing. You stay low as the giant swipes its terrible club. You press yourself against the rock for cover. His dim-witted eyes are watching you closely. All right, let's go for the jugular here. Readying yourself, you move in, preparing a swing that could cleave a tree trunk. You charge for your opponent. The giant evades as well as he can. The giant's eyes are bloodshot and he's moving much slower now. His stupid eyes follow your movements. All right, let's um, let's defend again. Uh, I could have really done something there. You drop down, protecting yourself. As the giant jabs with his club, you step smartly aside. Much more of this and he'll be using your bones to pick his teeth. All right, let's do this. Let's go for it. There we go. Stealing your courage, you move forwards. Mustering a blow that could part bone from bone, uh, you lunge forwards. Then your sword slips between a giant's ribs and he falls, gasping his last in a noise like a gushing waterfall. Eight stamina lost. Shameful. Yeah, that was pretty bad. <laughs> the mountainsides fall silent. Um, search the body. You quickly search the giant's body and find a pouch at his waist, containing eight gold pieces. It's hard to imagine a giant spending them. Perhaps he was not as dumb as he appeared. Or perhaps he liked them because they were shiny and nothing more. You like them too, so you take them. <laughs> um, search the cave. You explore into the depths of the giant's cave to see what you can find. At the back of the room, you find a large loaf of bread. It's too big to carry, but you could eat a little from it. Uh, yes, let's do that. You tear away the crusts with your sword and then eat a few handfuls from inside. It's fairly nourishing, if not pleasant. Good. Uh, Alright, let's uh, examine the body. 
You step over to the body. The giant is quite dead. His eyes stare open and his mouth is wide, mid-roar, showing his teeth. Um, do something about his eyes. Do something about his mouth. Uh, yeah, do something about his eyes. You pass a hand over his eyes to close them. Leave now. Time to move on. You hurry out of the shadow of the pass. All right, well, that was... That didn't go too poorly, although I'm down to eight stamina right now. Um, I guess I could uh, go into my spell book a little bit. Do I have... Um, do I have... I think there was a doctor one here. Uh, if I remember correctly, but I don't know if I have the... Yeah, I don't have a medicinal potion. Eh, alright. If there's one one problem I, I sort of have here is that there's a lot of spells, but you can't really... It's not very um, intuitive to try to find a spell that you want. Uh, stamina... Yeah, yeah, all right, whatever. Okay, uh, we've done that, so let us let us turn downhill. You crest the rise and continue down the slope on the other side. You pass out through another gigantic gate and into a barren mountainside. Okay. Let's see where we're at here. Approaching. Humpus? <laughs> oh, okay. Let's do that. The path trips and slides down a steep, scree slope, and then emerges onto a sudden plain as if the forest had been scooped away by a gigantic hand. A river trickles thinly between short grasses, and by its banks stands a tiny village. Do I enter the village or avoid the village? Um... Let's enter the village. Why not? Today has been mercifully short and uneventful. You have made excellent progress. With a decent meal and a night's sleep, your next day will start auspiciously. So you begin the gentle climb down on, into the village. You follow the path down into the village, passing a sign which declares it to be Humpus. The streets are thin and narrow, and the buildings have been set close together, uh, as if trying to withstand a storm. There's a terrible smell hanging in the air. All in all, it seems like an unpleasant place. An unpleasant place, yeah. Um, explore the town, talk to the villagers, find an inn. Uh, let's... Hmm, let's... Uh, let's find an inn, I guess. Or maybe I can explore the town a little bit. Let's try that first. Halfway along the track, you come across a couple of merchants' huts. You browse for items worth buying with your gold, your, with your eleven gold pieces. Your attention is taken by a finely woven skull cap, a finely crafted sword, and a small bag of provisions. Hmm. Examine the sword. Carefully, you lift the long sword from the table and swing it through the air. It cuts with a finely carved edge. A fine piece of work, I'm sure you'll agree. The merchant enthuses. Six gold pieces. Hmm. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, examine the skull cap. You pick up the skull cap and turn it over. Stolen from a priest of Dadule, the merchant declares with pride. A fine piece of work, four gold pieces. It looks like an object of magic properties, although what they might be is unclear. Um, now I want to save some of my gold here. That's enough. Uh, is there anything else I can help you with? Um, is there any work to be had here? I need to earn some money. The merchant sizes you up. You look like a good worker to me. One of my friends needs some digging doing. I'm sure he would pay you and feed you for it. Um, digging what? The merchant shifts uncomfortably. Does it matter? You'll find out. He stares at you. So, yes, he looks over his shoulder at the path. I'm going that way now myself. You coming? Hmm. Um, digging, huh? For some reason, I feel like he's digging my grave. <laughs> I don't know why. 
but I am I am intrigued. So let us let us take a look at it. He leads you to a house on the edge of the village and introduces you to the householder, a stout man who is probably incapable of lifting a spade, let alone digging with it. What is it you need doing? Cesspit, the man replies. Out back. Needs digging. <laughs> How much? Well, the man replies, it's pretty urgent. The old one's overflowing. How much money, you demand? Three gold pieces, he replies. All right, I'll get started. Spades out back, he replies with a jerk of his thumb. You walk through the man's house and into the back garden. The smell is terrible. The job will not just to dig a new cesspit, but to dig over the old one. And it's going to be several hours' work that'll probably take the whole night. You collect the spade, which is stuck in the ground by the hole. All right, start digging. You begin digging a new hole and tipping the earth into the old hole. The ground is hard, and the smell from the pit is enough to make you gag. After you've been working for an hour or so, the owner of the household brings you out something to eat and pays you three gold pieces for your efforts. It's hard to stomach the food with the smell on your hands and in the yard, but you're so hungry for the work that you wolf down the bread and soup he provides. Then it's back to work again for the remainder of the night. You are just finishing when the sun comes up. All right. Well, <laughs> didn't get my rest, but I did get some gold for my troubles. Um, and, you know, my stamina is okay as well. So, let us continue on. Leave this place. You rise early, thank the householder, and head out into the street. Within a few minutes of waking, of walking, you're out of humpus and back on the road. I have no idea if that's how you pronounce that. After another hour or so, the way branches with one path leading up to, into the hills and the other turning downhill and along one side of a barren, stony ridge. Is that a village you can make out on the top of the hill? It seems a lonely place for it. Hmm. Um, let's go uphill. The gentle upward slope becomes a steep climb and you are forced to rest several times. So far you have been walking through the foothills, now the journey will become more serious. When finally you reach the summit, you can look out over the low plateau you have crested. You see the path runs through a small settlement of cr crudely fashioned huts. There are villagers out in the street, t talking and working. It seems a happy, bustling place. There seems no obvious danger. You approach along the path until you are close enough for the villagers to notice you. The effect is immediate. They begin to scurry inside their huts as if you were an army and not a lone traveler. You cannot help but notice what a sorry bunch they are, squat and short, all limping strangely. Their bodies are thin and malnourished, and as they disappear through their doors, you notice some are missing limbs. Hmm. Well, I guess uh, stop at a door and knock. <laughs> there is no reply. All right, well, I figured that much. Um, enter the hut or another hut. <laughs> uh, so basically, I would be barging right into a hut. Is that what they're asking me to do? Hmm. Uh, no, I think uh, I think we've I think we should just leave. <laughs> that's my that's my thought on that. The place seems normal enough, but you cannot be sure. You take a side path out of the village as soon as one appears, out onto a ridge. Uh, keep going. The path turns down a steep, scree slope and into some trees. Alright, join the lower path. It is difficult to see the way ahead through the tree line, but you trust the course, and eventually the path bursts out onto a nar narrow stone ledge, high above the valley floor. The ledge leads left and right. There is no way forwards. Uh, look left. Looking, well, I'm, well, I hit right. Looking right, you are taking a back. As out of the mist that fills the valley, an impossibly wide bridge looms into view, as if it had only now fallen into place. It is made of planks and thick ropes, and is suspended from this peak to the peak on the other side. Who could have built such a marvel, and how long ago? Look left. Looking left, you can see that the narrow ledge is formed by a splitting of the rock that leads all the way down to the misty valley floor. If there's a path up the other side, it is not clear from here. Hmm. Look at the bridge. You take a moment more, staring at the bridge. It forms a delicate curve across the valley, swaying very slightly in the wandering wind. 
But the more you look, the more it seems too perfect. Could such a bridge possibly exist? Or is it mere illusion to trick the incautious traveler? Hmm. Hmm. Um. Yeah. Let's move on. Um. And yeah, <laughs> let's let's go into the valley. The bridge seems untrustworthy. Should anything happen while you were halfway across it, there would be no escape, but the last, most final kind. Better to walk. You make your way along the stone ledge. The angle is steep and it's hard going not to stumble. At the valley floor is a dried up river covered in worn stones honed by water that is now long gone. Small caves open in the rock face nearby with a rusted machinery abandoned outside. There was mining here once, but it must have been a long time ago. A wider track leads up the far slope. Um, investigate the mines. You approach the mine entrance. A wet wind greets you from the depths. The mine shaft must lead somewhere, but it is pitch dark. There are no torches, and you do not have any light of your own. Hmm. Uh, that would be probably a really bad idea. <laughs> Stumbling all over the place in a dark, in a dark mine. Uh, so let's go climb the valley. Your breath is short and your heart is hammering as you pause. Halfway up the valley slope, a small wooden hut is opposite, set a little way back from the path. Uh, look at the hut. You stop to watch the hut, dropping behind a bush out of sight as you do so. After a few minutes, you see a troll emerge, ducking to get through a tiny frame of the building. He is clearly guarding something around here, perhaps a mine, or perhaps he was stationed here long ago to guard a city that has now crumbled to ruin. Hmm. Wait to see what he does. The creature stands outside the hut for a few mo minutes, looking his this way and that. His colossal head turning with the speed and dexterity of a of a mill wheel. Then he stomps away around the curve of the hill. You probably have a few minutes before he reappear reappears. Um hmm. Go inside the hut. You seize the opportunity and race over to the hut to see what you can pilfer. Inside you find it is a barren shack. There is a low oak table in the center and no windows. There is no door. A pile of blankets in one corner is the only nicety. Uh, search the blankets. You lift the corner of the blanket with the tip of your sword, and hidden away you find three gold pieces. Most likely the trolls pay for the entire year. Uh, take the money. Uh, you take it quickly and drop the blankets back as you found them. The creature will be back any moment. You should go. Uh, leave. You have been here long enough. Quickly you turn and hurry away, just in time to see the troll returning from its patrol around the edge of the hill. It hasn't seen you, and is too stupid to notice anything you might have moved or left out of place. It moves to enter its hut. Uh, slip away. With the troll out of sight, you hurry away along the path, not pausing again until the hut is far out of sight. Alright. Um, keep walking. Another hour passes as you finish the climb. With the sun starting to hang heavy in the sky, you reach the top and meet with the other end of the rope bridge. Look back at the bridge. It may look stable, but it is undoubtedly a death trap to part travelers from their gold and from their lives. You continue on down the slope as evening draws in. Yeah, I was going to say, the troll was probably uh, collecting tolls on the bridge, I would imagine. Uh, head for the town. Some way down the hill you stop for a rest and sit on a boulder to survey what lies ahead. The path leads downwards and at its foot, cradled between three peaks, is a village, and quite a large one at that, compared to that mournful spot you have just passed through. Behind you, the sun is fa falling rapidly into the hills. It will be night soon. Approach the village. The village looks like a good place to stop. You hop down from the boulder and make your way forward, when an overhanging branch touches your face and you hear a lively chirping. Um, hmm, hmm, um, freeze, whip out my sword, turn around, or keep going, uh, let's see, uh, I guess, uh, whip out my sword, or, ah, oh, I hit turn around, 
You turn, you turn quickly around. Hovering by your shoulder is a small creature the size of a bird. It is childlike but very thin with green skin, and it flits around you on transparent wings. It seems friendly enough. It even lands on your shoulder, its tiny, tiny clawed toes pinching slightly. Hmm. It's almost like a, a fairy, almost, but I guess I guess not. Um, I guess talk to it. Oh, shake it loose. <laughs> you try to bat the creature off your arm. Don't do that. It complains in a shrill and squeaky voice. You'll break me. <laughs> then get off my shoulder. The thing hops from one side of your head to the other. It's flickering rings buzzing past your face in an irritating fashion. And hello to you, the creature replies, chirping. My name is Jan. Yep, that's exactly what it is. Uh, what are you? The creature does a backflip and gives a low bow. I am a min minimite. Min min minimite. Pleased to meet you. It reaches out a tiny hand and shakes your earlobe. <laughs> I'll eat you if you try that again. I'll choke you if you do. The creature whips back. Tiny bones. <laughs> um... What can you tell me about the village? You point down the valley. Is it safe? That's Viratani. And it's very safe. It's the largest village in the whole of the Shamatani Hills. Every traveler who comes this way spends at least one night there. So it's a little bit expensive, especially for Minimites. But pleasant enough. The creature starts hopping up and down. Come on! It grumbles impatiently. Let's get going, can't we? Alright. Well, uh, let's get going then. Creature shakes you by the ear in excitement, and you set off along the path once more. You descend into the bowl of the valley. The hills on either side are toweringly tall and throw the village into a, into deep shadow. It would seem a very gloomy, threatening place, but from the streets come the distant sound of laughter and merriment. And now I've got Navi on my shoulder. <laughs> uh, all right, enter the town. You continue along the path. The sounds of festivities grow louder. It's almost spooky. Here in the shade of the valley and after so long on a dire road, the people in this village seem to be enjoying themselves. See, the minimite on your shoulder remarks, I told you it was a happy place. Um, Fan, what's going on? What's going on here? Are they bewitched? Jan, I should say. Jan shakes his head. No, if there was magic, believe me, I'd know. This is the festival of the young. Hmm. What's that? Well, take a look. Jan waves a little hand around the village. The idea is that once a year, the children are allowed the freedom of the village. It is a time of great fun and lots of pranks. It becomes quickly obvious what he means. You pass the first few buildings where you find a number of children sitting on the street and drinking ale from deep mugs. Further on, a young boy is holding an old woman over his knee and <laughs> spanking her. On the other side of the street, a group of boys is fighting outside a hut with a sign that reads, Glen Dragor's Tavern. It's all a complete mayhem. <laughs> oh, nice. Let's uh, let's enter the tavern. Behind the bar, a thick-set man is wiping mugs down with an old rag. Greetings, stranger, he calls. I am Glendragor. Can I be helping you? Uh, greetings. Or how much is ale, I guess. Well, let's do greetings. Greetings, I've come a long way. I'm sure you have. Take a seat. You do so, and Jan leaps up and onto the counter. Glen Dragor seems amused rather than alarmed by the creature. How much is ale? How much is a mug of ale, you ask? Two gold pieces, and it's the finest in town. Well, it's the only ale in town. I make sure of that. <laughs> um, all right, buy a mug. You put two gold pieces down on the countertop, and Glen Dragor pulls a mug of beer. It's warm, frothy, and deeply refreshing. Glen Dragor smiles. You look like you've been on the road a while. <laughs> you have no idea, you reply. Glen Dragor nods. <laughs> Tell me about this village. Glen Dragor shrugs. Not much to say. What you see is what you get. The place keeps going because it's the only route between Kare and Kantapani. It's one of those mountains... It's one of these mountains falls or the river freezes over. Uh, then this place will be a desert in two weeks. <laughs> um, tell me about yourself. Me? Why? He spreads his hands. I'm a normal enough fellow. What you see is what you get with me. That's what I always say. All right, leave. 
You know where to find me when you dry out, he says. Okay. <laughs> uh, go further into town. You head out of the tavern and turn a corner to find a group of girls standing by a signpost pointing to the crystal waterfall. They are tipping up their elders as they pass and giggling. <laughs> um, ask, them about, ask them about the waterfall. You stop by the group and ask them about the waterfall, but they are too distracted by Jan, whom they delight in poking, tickling, and generally cooing over. After a few minutes of asking them about the waterfall, you give up and walk away. One of the girls calls, Come back! Another shouts, The water is good for you! Jan sighs, already missing the attention, but comes back to rest on your shoulder. <laughs> Move on. You leave the girls to their snickering. Uh, let's see if we can find an inn. You find the village inn buried under a rocky overhang. The proprietor stands in the doorway, a formidable young girl, armed with a baker's paddle. <laughs> what do you want? She squeaks at you. Uh, a bed. Five gold pieces, she says. Plenty of travelers in Brettani. We only want the best. All right, I will pay it. You pay the girl five gold pieces and she directs you up a winding set of stairs to a room in the rafters of the house. From here, you have a perfect view over the madness in the streets outside. Children are running riot with blazing torches, waving them in the faces of adults they pass. A few men have their legs and arms tied around fence posts. If this wasn't a festival, it would be a revolution. <laughs> uh, go to sleep. But never mind their problems. Lying down with your sword unsheathed and ready in your grip, you stretch yourself out on a straw matting. Jan curls up under your ear. Perhaps if you rise early, you can slip out without his noticing. The noise from the streets begins to subside as darkness spreads across the village. Your stomach rumbles painfully as you try to sleep. Eh, I should have probably eaten something, I guess. <laughs> your dreams are full of plagued victim victims, their faces raw with boils and steaming sores. The rest of the night passes silently. Um, we should probably go to items, go to rations. Can I eat one? Yeah, let's eat a ration there. Very good. And uh, I think that will just about do it for this episode of Sorcery. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. And I will see you next time.